Pede College of Hospitality Management Studies. I, Rahul Parchure, working as an assistant professor, would like to extend a warm welcome to the speaker of the day, the participants, and to our principal, Mrs. Sayogita Morarji, along with my team members of RPH for the tea appreciation seminar organized on behalf of this college. I would request all the participants to kindly mute themselves and keep their videos on. I'll repeat my instructions. I would request all the participants to mute themselves and keep their videos on. All the existing students are required to mention their batch numbers along with the names in the chat box option. The remaining participants can just mention their names. I'll repeat the instructions. All the existing students of the college can mention their roll numbers along with the batch and name in the chat box options. The rest of the participant can just mention their names in the chat box. Thank you. It gives me immense pleasure to introduce to our guest, Mr. Divyanshu Divivedi. Mr. Divyanshu Divivedi is a certified beverage trainer and a facilitator with more than 15 plus years of experience, which includes the areas like f and operations, training and education, specializing in tea, wines, spirits, and beer. Sir is currently heading the trainings and tasting for TWG, a Singapore-based firm which specializes in the teas from different source gardens and offers over 800 different single estate harvest and exclusive blends from all the 46 different tea producing countries of the world. The highlights of the seminar today are going to be history and origin of the tea, different varieties of the tea, tea cultivation and the method of processing, perfect brewing of tea, pairing of food and tea. May I now request Mr. Divyanshu Drivedi to commence the webinar. Thank you, Rahul. Thank you for the introduction. Very, very good morning to Principal Ma'am, to all the faculties from Ramanath Payare College of Hospitality, and a very warm welcome to all the students and our esteemed guests on behalf of Ramanath Payare College, as well as GWGT India. So like Rahul said, uh, I uh, had the trainings and tastings for TWGT in India. So TWG, uh, just to give you a little brief on what TWG is all about, TWG stands for the Wellbeing Group. So that's the company I represent and I work for. So we are actually into production of some luxury trees, some single estate trees and exclusive blends. So we import our teas from almost all the 46 different countries of the world. And we have our main unit, our main head office and the manufacturing unit is based in Singapore. And that is where we blend our teas, we package them, and then we distribute again to almost 42 different countries, including India. So the best part about TWG is we deal only in uh, whole leaf, orthodox leaves. We'll, we'll obviously going to talk about this in the presentation, what is a whole leaf or an orthodox leaf tea. And we also source our teas, like I said, from almost every tea producing country, especially uh, we, we specialize in single states. Uh, we also have some exclusive blends coming in from all the tea producing countries. So the best part is our tea experts, they travel every year to these countries to select the best teas for, for uh, our portfolio. And then has, and that's how we actually keep on increasing our portfolio, if you see every year. And as of now, we have the largest tea list in the world with having more than 800 tea varieties uh, under, our, under our belt, under our portfolio. So uh, in India, we have been there for almost four years now, and we have exclusive stores at the Delhi airport and also at the Ubra Delhi, where we also retail our teas. We also have an online channel uh, website called the wellness store.in where we also sell our teas, which is also has uh, a very good information as far as uh, all our tea brands and varieties are concerned. So uh, to, to begin with, I think Rahul has already introduced all the topics, all the sessions, which are, we are going to cover in today's uh, session. So we will start with the interesting history of tea, uh, how tea originated and how then the tea culture spread around the world. And then moving forward, we will also, discuss about the tea varieties, the different types of teas that we come across. And most importantly, the manufacturing or the production process, how these teas are made. So how the whole leaf teas or how the orthodox leaves are different from the teas that we use at home, the CTC teas. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about these. And I also have an interesting video on the production process, which we'll see. I hope uh, as I've uh, instructed, everyone has got a cup of tea with you. So very important that we all have a tea cup of tea with us when we are attending this session. If you don't have it, you can probably quickly take a two minute break, quickly grow, brew it tea and come back with a cup of tea if possible. Uh, and it's, I mean, to enjoy tea appreciation, I think is best thing to do is to keep sipping on the nice tea, one of your favorite 
teas which you like probably can just brew it and keep it with you so yes so moving forward we'll also we'll also talk about uh, the flushes in teas what are the different harvesting periods time when teas uh, are, the leaves are plucked and uh, so on and so forth and at the end we'll also talk about uh, the tea and food pairing which is very very important especially from the hospitality uh, perspective from the students point of view because nowadays tea and uh, food pairing is something which is very very popular a lot of guests they want their teas to be paired with food same like it is with wine and food pairing so that is something which we'll also going to talk about i'll try and give you some parameters how to pair your different types and styles of teas and uh, and then at the end we'll also have a question and answer round so if you have any questions you can obviously uh, put it in the chat box and i guess one of the faculties will take a note of your questions and then at the end we will have some time to answer your queries uh, in fact i'll also try and share my uh, email id in case you want to uh, send out any queries any questions to me later on on my email address i'll be more than happy to answer them uh, at at a later stage all right so to start with let me just uh, share the presentation so we have, we have a powerpoint presentation to go with so we'll we'll stick to this presentation and we will uh, go one by one covering the points the slides mentioned in this so like i said now twgt the, the it stands for the wellbeing group and if, if you see here on the slide the first slide it says 80 the year 1837 so 1837 actually is not the year when we started 1837 is the year when singapore like i said now twg is based out of singapore our main unit our main head office is singapore so 1837 is the year when singapore was actually declared uh, officially declared as a port for import and export of teas and other epicurean products and hence 1837 is a year which has a very very important significance if you see in singapore's history and uh, and we also value that particular year so that's the reason why we always have it on our logo 1837 but if you talk about the commencement of the company we actually started operations in the year 2008 that is when twg came into existence and the company was actually founded by two passionate uh, tea connoisseurs you can say uh, one was mr taha bagdi who's our main founder and his wife uh, ms marandis so they both actually were tea lovers tea connoisseurs uh, mr taha bagdi actually comes from from morocco so morocco has a very different tea culture moroccan mint teas are very very popular and that's that's how tea was always there in his blood and he always uh, used to appreciate tea and drink a lot of teas right from his childhood and while he was growing up he was also traveling across the different countries and he started collecting tea which became an hobby and then hobby at a certain point of time changed into a profession when he thought of establishing his own kind of uh, company in the year 2008 and currently if you see we we import almost about uh, like i said about 800 varieties of teas and our total production is about 900 tons of teas which are sold every year so we deal in both tea bags as well as the loose teas going further in this presentation i'll talk about the tea bags also what's the main difference between using tea bags and the loose teas but yes we deal in both the varieties moving further what what uh, i'll just uh, this map i will just show you this map which actually talks about all the 46 different tea producing countries of the world from where we take our teas from so some of the major countries if you see like china brazil australia these are our main suppliers or these are the, our main importers from where we import but yes we have our teas from everywhere from india also we have got an excellent collection of teas coming in from almost all the tea producing regions of india starting from darjeeling assam nilgiri so we have all these beautiful teas coming to our main unit in singapore from all these different tea producing countries and then we distribute like i said across 42 different countries so our journey with with hotels with with the horeca segment with hotel industry actually started with uh, the hotel called ritz paris uh, ritz carlton paris which is actually uh, part of the marriott group so ritz carlton paris is also considered to be one of the top luxury hotels in the world and considered to be an epitome of hospitality a lot of hotels especially the five star luxury segments they actually look at the ritz carlton paris and follow the standards that they have so we thought it's always best to start with the best hotel uh, and that's how our journey with hotels started and currently if you see most of our clients I mean, the, the the industry which buys our teas is basically the horeca industry the hotels restaurants and the, the catering segment uh, because the kind of teas that we have most of the hotels would you like to have them at the restaurants or probably also in the rooms for the guests to enjoy so moving forward now what are the different types of teas that we deal with I and mean, what are the different types of teas that we make so like i said uh, 
the kind of portfolio that we have, we try to match every consumer's palette. So it could be could be a black tea, it could be a green tea, it could be white tea, yellow tea. We also make nice blended teas. And we have a different portfolio altogether for herbal teas as well. So sometimes people who are not very really keen to drink teas or, not, or probably prone to caffeine, which is that they usually like to have some herbal teas or some tisans. So that's the reason why we also got some herbal teas like the chamomile tea or the red tea, also known as the rooibos tea. So we'll, we'll talk about these teas also, how they are different from teas, but just to give you an idea. So in this picture, you can see all the different types of teas, very colorful teas. So that's how we, we create our blends because we believe that uh, tea, offering tea to the consumers or to the guests is not only <coughs> just a beverage, but it's actually also an experience altogether. So it's just like how you, how you present wine or you present any other food uh, on your menu. It's just like, uh, it's about tea also, the, the, the way you present it how beautifully you present it also matters a lot. So yes, so that's the reason why we have got uh, all the different varieties of teas blended with different fruit extracts, could be from uh, flowers extracts, all the natural extracts that we use to make our teas. So let's, let's, let's come to now what tea exactly is all about. So this is something which is very important for us to know. So all the teas actually come from one particular plant uh, and the botanical name of the plant is Camellia sinensis. This plant was actually discovered uh, 5,000 years ago. And that's how uh, now we, the beverage that we call tea now actually was supposed to be called uh, Camellia sinensis or Cha. So China was the country which, which discovered. And uh, there are again, a lot of interesting stories. If you go through Google, if you go through books, you'll find a lot of interesting stories around, around tea. But one story which has been accepted by, by the tea experts and also the historians is about the Emperor Shen Nong, uh, who actually discovered tea uh, back in the year 2700 BC. So if you see, that's that old the history of tea is. I mean, the history goes back to almost uh, 5000 years ago, which was before Christ. And hence, we say that tea is also the oldest known beverage known to mankind, to human after, after water, and also the largest drunk beverage in the world after water. So just, just to share some interesting facts now, if you see uh, all over the world, it's the black teas, which are the favorites. Uh, that's the maximum which are sold. India is also the largest producer of black tea in the world. And uh, when we, it comes to the overall production of teas, it's China, who's number one in the overall production of teas, and India is number two. But yes, in, like I said, in, in black, since India is a black tea market completely, and Indian black tea, especially black teas from Assam and all, they are very much preferred across the countries, across the globe, especially in the European continent. So we, we uh, deal a lot in, in black teas and black teas are specialities. So we also the number one consumer in the world, though we don't produce that many teas, that much tea as China, but yes, in India, we consume uh, a lot of tea. So which, which is something which is good because in that tea culture is still, I would say, continuing in India. And though some of the youngsters are now moving into coffee, but you can still be proud of that tea, still the, the largest or the highest drunk beverage in India. So yes, coming back to history, uh, Camellia sensus was something which was discovered by chance by this uh, person called as Shen Nong. So Shen Nong was, uh, like I said, he was he was a Chinese emperor and he, he was also a herbalist, which means he, by, by interest, he also used to do, uh, a lot of, he used to make a lot of medicines, he used to experiment a lot with a lot of herbs, botanicals, because people in those days, I mean, in 2700 BC, if I talk about, uh, they used to survive more on the natural medicines like nowadays how we have some ayurvedic medicines so this is something uh, which he used to do he used to go to the forest pick up some herbs botanicals he used to make his own medicines and he used to also serve the community so one fine day uh, he was just uh, roving around searching for some herbs and he was carrying a pot of hot water with them because in those days the people they always used to uh, drink a lot of warm water hot water to keep themselves immune to protect themselves from diseases so this person was also having so after going around for, for, for quite a while after a long walk, he felt a little tired and he thought of resting and he sat, sat under a tree for some time and just started sipping his uh, warm water. So, but suddenly uh, a strong wind came in and blown by the wind, a few leaves from the tree where he was sitting under the tree, from that tree, a few dried leaves fell from the tree and uh, fell into his pot of hot water. So as soon as these leaves fell into his pot, he saw that the color started changing. And when he, he also, took a sniff and he found that the aroma was very, very interesting uh, and very intriguing. So he thought of taking a sip. And the moment he sipped it, he found that this particular beverage 
was almost like checking his entire body was investigating his body and he got a very relaxing and a very soothing feeling after taking the first sip and immediately the name cha came from his mouth which cha like i said in chinese actually means something which checks or which investigates so this was the first name given to this beverage so that's how it was actually you can say discovered by chance by by emperor shen no? and there are a couple of other stories also there are some uh, fictional stories also which we are not sure if they are true or not like there is a story uh, about uh, a buddhist monk called bodhidharma who is a very very popular monk from india so bodhidharma uh, traveled uh, to china and he went into uh, uh, a, a very long meditation and during these monks they used to meditate a lot and during the meditation sometimes when they used to feel asleep uh they used to drink tea but then at that time obviously tea was not discovered so bodhidharma he was trying to he was trying to concentrate he was trying to meditate but he felt a little sleepy and for a second he just closed his eyelids so what he did was he took a knife he immediately cut his off his eyelids just to make sure that he is not closing his eyes and those the place where those eyelids fell on on the ground uh immediately uh, a tea plant or a tea sapling sprouted from there so that's that's another story which you will find some some places uh though it does not seem to be very true but yes uh one one thing which is very true about teas is uh, these buddhist monks they played a very very important role actually in spreading the tea culture so once tea was discovered in china these monks whenever they used to travel they always used to carry some tea samples or some amount of teas stocks with them because the tea always used to help them stay awake and also helps them stay immune from diseases while they used to travel in fact the black tea was also discovered by chance with these buddhist monks and later on china started producing black teas because if you see initially till till say about uh, the 8th century ad all the teas which were been produced by china uh, or even say by other countries they were all basically green teas so this process of uh, black tea black tea actually has a very different process which we i will talk about little further when we talk about the production process so black teas are supposed to be oxidized so they undergo a process called oxidation and when buddhist monks they used to travel with these teas the green teas sometimes the teas used to get obviously exposed to extreme climatic conditions like could be rainfall could be hot weather in the summers and obviously in that time they didn't had uh, a proper storage facilities like an air air tight tin or something to carry these teas so most of the time they used to carry these teas loose uh, maybe tied in a in a cloth or something and because of the climatic conditions the teas automatically used to get oxidized because of sometimes humidity or probably hot temperatures and the color used to turn from green to black and but then when these monks they brewed this black tea they found that even the brew was very different the infusion was very different it was darker in color it had a very prominent strong flavors compared to the green tea and it also had a little more thin content which basically say helped them stay awake for a longer period and probably gave them a quick instant kick which the green tea was not giving them so that is that that's how a new style of making tea came into picture and when china started export uh, to countries like europe uh, they actually started doing making black teas because europe was obviously the teas had to travel a long distance when they had to travel from china all the way to to europe and that's how uh, they started making black teas because green teas was very prone to the weather conditions i mean they were very delicate sometimes they used to get spoiled very quickly the shelf life i would say was less especially in those conditions because talking about that time i mean the 8th century that time main transport was actually through water so most of the teas used to travel through ships from china to europe and other countries and on ships sometimes the climate used to be very hot and humid uh, and the teas used to get uh, say spoiled easily but black tea was something which could stay for long journeys and could also bear strong weathers so that's how they started also producing black teas and and trade with europe if you see started around 13th century mainly uh, and by the 16th century uh, it was dutch who the people from from holland they were the first one who took the initiative to actually import because dutch were already like i said trading with china a lot from the 13th century onward but 16th century finally they thought that they should also uh, import some tea and say again re-export it to the european markets because tea was getting very popular so when it was discovered in 2700 bc uh, as, as i said it was ma- mainly it was used for medicinal purposes so people used to have it as medicines used to uh like for for pain relief for stomach aches for arthritis and all these medicines the chinese people used to always use the tea leaves but by the 3rd century ad tea was declared as a national drink because of its health benefits national drink of china and then they started consuming tea on a regular basis and then when the other countries obviously who were trading with china they also came to know about teas then they started 
exporting and the dutch people they played a very important role especially exporting teas to countries like uh, england and england or say the english people actually they're very fond of the black teas because like i said when when china started exporting teas to uk it was mainly the black teas because black teas could survive long journeys and black teas became really really popular especially among the royal families the rich upper class in in in, uh, in uh, europe in, in england because uh, like i said that time tea was an expensive commodity at least for the european people because uh, the dutch people were importing it and then again re-exporting it so it had a lot of taxes a lot of duties being imposed on it which made it an exp- expensive commodity in the initial days hence it was expensive so only the people the upper class uh, the higher society or say the royal families the kings and the queens they used to have it as a beverage in their court in fact I, i'm sure you must have all heard about the english breakfast tea which is very very popular in the hospitality industry also we usually people prefer to drink a cup of english breakfast tea because in the morning because it is supposed to be a part of the breakfast uh, or say the breakfast menu and english breakfast tea actually was became popular because uh, like i said uh, the queen of england she used to like she always used to have a strong cup of black tea with her breakfast and this black tea used to be a combination blend of three black teas coming from three different countries so one was obviously assam which was the major blend then the second is a kenyan black tea and the third one was a uh, ceylon black tea ceylon is basically the old name for sri lanka so these three country and in fact still if you see most companies which make english breakfast teas they still have or they still use the same blend which is uh, the assam ceylon and the kenyan blend to make the english breakfast teas and the name english breakfast was given only because this particular blend was very popular with uh, the royal families of england and they always used to prefer to have a strong cup of black tea in the breakfast so that's that's how tea culture started spreading from china and it also reached ja- countries like japan through the buddhist monks and the europe through dutch talking about india if we talk about india now the history of tea in india so india again the credit goes actually to british because like i said the english people were already drinking tea from around the 16th century and by that time in india there was no tea production in india the tea production started uh, only in the 18th century when we were under the british rule so when india was a british colony so what happened was like i said now china was the main uh, exporter of tea to england but in the year 1840 uh, there was a war between china and england because china was uh, exporting teas to england and england in return was giving a lot of opium opium was basically sup- supposed to be a drug which uh, china used to take for medicinal purposes but then as the the opium trade increased in china a lot of people especially the youngsters started getting into this uh, habit of taking opium as a drug and a lot of uh, illegal practices started happening in china so suddenly china when he saw that a lot of youngsters getting addicted to opium they stopped exporting opium from from england and uh, he immediately also start, stopped exporting teas to england so which means both the trade stopped and then both the countries got into a war situation because of this and finally but then by that time english people obviously they wanted tea because they were already can say fond of or probably got addicted to the black teas and but by that time they were lucky enough that the tea plantations or the commercial plantations in assam were ready because uh, there was an english guy when i like i said in the 1840s india was also under the british rule so there was a person called robert bruce so robert is known as the pioneer of tea in india he was in the british army in the intelligence department and he used to travel all around the world and on a on a mission he was actually sent to assam and uh, in assam actually he found some teas uh, a plant which was growing which was something very similar to tea he found that and he thought that this could be tea but he was not very sure so he plucked few saplings he took some seeds from assam it was just going wild in the forest nobody knew that this is actually tea which is growing in assam but it was very similar to the tea which was growing in china so he took those samples he sent them all the way to the botanical garden in calcutta for a testing in the lab to test to prove whether it is tea and the botanical garden actually confirmed that yes this belonged to the same family which is the camellia family but they were not sure if this is the same variety sinensis which is growing in china and then finally uh, they managed to send some samples to china just to get a confirmation whether this is the same tea and then the chinese people confirmed that this is a, the same uh, botanical plant which is camellia but it's a different species which is called the camellia assamica species so now if you see currently the camellia family has three different species though it's the one plant but it has three different varieties same like in in mangoes for example you have you have alfonso or probably you have kesar you have different varieties of mangoes coming in from different part of india same way in teas there were three different varieties which were discovered so first was camellia sinensis which is the oldest that comes from china 
Second was this local variety from Assam in India. It was called Camellia sinensis assamica. And there is one more variety which was discovered later on from a country called Cambodia. It's called Camellia sinensis Cambodia. Now, Cambodian variety is not very popular. Assamica and sinensis are the two main varieties, the Chinese tea and the Indian teas, which are more popular. Cambodian varieties are usually made for use in certain blends. But yes, these are the three different species which were found. So Chinese uh, confirmed that, yes, this is tea, which was growing in Assam. But it's a different variety. It's a native variety to Assam. And that's and the moment they came to know, the Britishers came to know that this is tea, they started encouraging the local farmers in Assam and a lot of commercial tea plantations came in. And the first uh, consignment of made black tea was sent to England from India in the year 1839, and which was sold in an auction in the year 1840. And that tea went for a very, very high price in the auction so because that tea was actually loved by the English people more than compared to the Chinese black tea. Because Assam black tea, if you see, those the climatic conditions in Assam. It's much more uh, stronger in terms of flavor, character, and also has a very nice aroma and flavor to it. So that's how and now Assam teas became really, really popular. In fact, if you see, in, at present, India is one of the major uh, exporters of black teas to, to Europe. China is also doing it, but then we, our black teas are more preferred, especially the Assam black teas are more preferred in these European countries. So, yeah, so that's what a that's what, uh, little history of tea all about, how tea is culture spread and how uh, we started drinking our tea. So, like I said, in the 1840s, tea was introduced to India, but it was all about the brewed teas, the black teas, which the British people used to drink, and that's how they. So, but then, like most other things, like I mean, because we Indians, we always love to give everything our own twist, and slowly and steadily, this black tea or this brewed tea, which they used to brew separately with some hot water and say some uh, tea leaves became a masala chai or maybe a cutting chai on the street because people started boiling everything together in India. We started making our tea in our own way. That's the way we like it. Like we put everything together in a pan, hot water, some milk, sugar, spices, and then we boil everything together. So that's basically a style of making tea in India. We call it the Indian style of chai, Indian chai or masala chai. But yes, uh, if you still see in India, uh, like the, the diversity of the country is the same way the tea drinking culture in India is also very diverse. In certain places, we people prefer to have a strong cup. In some places, they put a lot of milk to it. Sometimes you'll see some, like if you go to Kashmir and all, there's a different tea culture altogether. They drink a lot of kawas, which is basically a tea brewed with a lot of different spices, some dry fruits. So, so yes, if you see, it's, it's again, every 100 kilometers, the tea drinking culture of India varies depending on what kind of tea styles people prefer to drink. So that's how, uh, that's what all about the history, as you would have seen, the history of tea is quite interesting, how the tea culture spread all over the world. Moving on to the next important thing is uh, the tea types, the tea varieties. Now, before we talk about tea types or tea varieties, it's also very important to understand uh, what exactly the tea is all about. Since we were saying in the beginning that it's a plant, tea is a plant. Actually, if you see tea is not a plant, though we call it a plant. And in fact, you must have seen on the televisions also, or some of you if have been, been to any of these tea gardens, you will see that these ladies, they, they pick up the tea leaves and they have a bamboo basket tied on their back and they keep putting the leaves in the baskets. So that is basically the, the tea plants that you see in the tea gardens, the tea estates, which are actually maintained at a height of about something around three to three and a half feet. But actually, if you allow the tea plant to grow wild, I mean, if you don't do the pruning or the cutting, it can actually grow up to a height of 17 to 18 feet, which is like a tree. So actually tea, tea is not, not a bush or say not a plant, it's actually a tree. In fact, in China, uh, there is a place called Yunnan province wherein you'll still find there are some very old tea trees standing tall, about 20, 25 feet tall. But yes, in most countries where tea plantations or tea cultivation happens, they do a pruning, which is basically the cutting of uh, the tea the branches after every, I think, couple of years to maintain that height of about three to three and a half feet so that it is easier for people to pluck. But yes, uh, certain places in China, they still grow these tea trees and they pluck the leaves from the tea trees also to make certain varieties of tea, which I'll tell you later what varieties of tea they use. But just remember that, yes, tea is actually not a bush or a shrub. It's actually a proper tree which can grow up to a height of about 18 to 20 feet. And uh, talking about the varieties of teas, so like I said in the beginning, every tea comes, all the main six varieties of tea, except the herbal teas and the tisans, uh, which are made, could be from dried flowers, fruits, or probably the roots of certain plants or some herbs are not considered in this. But anything which comes from the Camellia sinensis family or the tea plant would be a tea. So it could be green tea, yellow teas, blue, or we also call oolong teas, then black teas, mature teas, and white teas. So I'll cover these 
uh, one by one just to give you a quick idea on how these teas are different from each other so like i said now all teas they come from the same plant so ultimately they will all have some amount of theine content or what we also known as caffeine so just just going back to our our previous slide so this says tea naturally contains theine now most of us we all know that tea has caffeine so actually theine is also a type of caffeine but we don't call it caffeine it's a different uh can say a category of caffeine it's called theine coffee has caffeine but we say tea has theine but both of them actually have similar effect on our body both are actually stimulants like for example when you have a cup of coffee you get an instant kick uh because caffeine is something which uh gets released into our or absorbed in our blood stream very quickly whereas if you talk about theine theine has a different composition altogether so theine is something which is also a type of caffeine but the molecular structure is very different so the molecules of theine are actually sometimes very closely binded and also binded to other substances found in tea so when you consume a cup of tea what happens is these uh theine the molecules they take time to break which means obviously our blood stream will take time to absorb it and hence the same effect which tea will have will take a little more time and tea initially also has a little relaxing and a soothing or a calming effect before it reenergizes you whereas coffee has an instant energizing effect on the body because tea also contain another uh, amino acid it's called theanine uh, a lot of people get confused between theine and theanine so there's a difference so theine is like i said is a stimulant like caffeine and theanine is an amino acid which is known to give a relaxing and a soothing effect which is basically restoring the energy of our body so it's not like only giving you an instant kick but the theanine helps to also restore energy hence we say that tea is uh, as a beverage is much more beneficial to our body or has much more health benefits compared to a coffee beer because coffee mostly you drink only for caffeine sometimes to just reenergize or refresh yourself but tea has both the effects on the body so that is uh, something about theanine going back to now the different uh, types of teas which we were discussing so like i said now every tea as uh, the, the obviously when you want to make these teas you have to have to pluck the leaves so plucking again is done at a certain time of the year so like uh, in wines uh, i'm sure those of you must have studied wines as part of your syllabus you must have come across a term called vintage why every wine body will have a vintage year so vintage actually means the year or the time of the year, time, year when you pluck the uh, grapes to make wines or harvest the grapes in tea something similar happens but we don't call it vintage we call it uh, flush so flush is something which is uh, and could could be not one time in a year but could be multiple times in a year so one particular tea could have two flushes or even three flushes in a year especially with teas like darjeeling and assam so let's quickly go through flushes also because sometimes when you go to some specialty tea store or in fact a lot of five star hotels they also have uh, sometimes you'll find that teas coming in from different flushes like probably a first flush assam or could be a second flush darjeeling so when you when you see this term flush you can easily understand that flush actually means the time of the year when this leaves were harvested or the leaves were plucked to make teas so uh, most of the teas usually have three plucking uh, seasons or as you can say it can be plucked three times in a year especially starting with the spring season which is the the starting of the year the beginning of the year the month between february to april so that's when the leaves are when you make, pluck those leaves the leaves are very fresh very crisp and they give you a light floral and aromatic cup of tea because what happens before february usually there is no harvesting so for example most places like darjeeling assam or even the colder countries where you will see a winter period somewhere between say november onwards till january and these winters are very severe which means there will be a lot of frost a lot of dew on the on the leaves and hence uh, they don't pluck the leaves because if you pluck those leaves with a lot of dew a lot of frost there will be a lot of moisture basically on the leaves that you don't get the quality tea because moisture or water is something which is not good for teas for making if you're making good quality teas and same happens in the rainy season also so like for example in india if you see mostly during the period from july till august or even say till beginning of september because that's the peak peak rain rain season they will not pluck the leaves because again the same reason there will be a lot of moisture a lot of water on the leaves during the rains so that period is known as dormancy period when the leaves or the plants are allowed to rest so there is no plucking no harvesting but yes apart from that the other time or other months the the harvesting goes on so in february to april is the first harvest which is basically the teas are very fresh they just wake up after the long rest in the winter season 
and hence they give you a very light floral and aromatic cup and darjeeling is specially known for producing some very good quality first flush tea so if you see a lot of people who are fan of darjeeling tea who like darjeeling teas they always go will probably will go for the first flush darjeeling because that is much more light and floral very aromatic tea whereas again certain teas will have second flushes also in fact darjeeling and assam they both have a second flush which is just before the rain start so in the month of may and june the second harvest the second plucking of leaves will happen and that plucking is known as the second harvest now that plucking obviously will give you a much stronger cup of tea because what happens when the sun shines uh when when obviously the temperatures are high it has an effect on the tea leaves also like when you make wines what happens the grapes they ripen quickly when the weather is hot same way in tea i mean leaves the tea leaves also have certain compounds like uh fat polyphenols some catechins which with the high temperatures or high humidity levels start converting into flavonoids and flavonoids which give ultimately more color more flavor and more body to the teas hence if you see the second flush teas like assam are very powerful and probably sometimes give you a very good full bodied strong cup of tea with a sweet and fruity kind of notes that is called the second flush and then the third flush is again something which will is not very popular but then mostly it is used in blending blending of the teas so so after the summer this second flush use third flush sorry the autumn flush we call it comes just before the winter starts and after the rains end and this kind of teas usually create a dark infusion with a nutty taste they are good in color and they have a slightly nutty profile and since they are good in color and have a slightly nutty taste they go well with blending with the delicate teas like nilgiris and all if you go to south of india there is uh, they don't have any flushes as such because they harvest their teas all around the year especially the southern part of it like the nilgiris or the munnar and all these places even karnataka has some tea plantations because the climate is very moderate in south of india and sometimes they receive alternate spells of rainfalls almost around the year so you can always harvest teas and make teas but yes uh, again if you talk about the profile of the teas from coming from south of india are very very delicate soft little spicy notes and like nilgiris and all again very good for blending with something like assam which is very strong and then you have some very delicate teas so what i'm trying to say is basically uh, tea is like same like wine uh, needs a particular terroir i mean terroir means uh, climatic condition water soil and the geographical location of the place same goes with teas also so the flavor profile the color of the teas or even say the body of the taste of the teas will also depend on which place the tea is coming from if it is from darjeeling obviously it will be much more floral light bodies uh teas with a lot of uh, can say light and floral notes because darjeeling has a different soil uh, all together and also has a very good climatic condition which means like it has good winters has good amount of rainfall and hence darjeeling teas are also appreciated all over the world in fact darjeeling uh, i'm sure you must be must have heard about this that darjeeling is also known to be the champion of tea like champion is considered to be the best wine so same way some people give sh- the name champion to tea darjeeling tea because darjeeling is considered to be the best teas in the world in fact in the year 2003 darjeeling also got its own gi status which is a geographical indicator like how champagne has it so they say the wines coming from champagne region can only be called champagnes the so same way darjeeling has its own gi status which means that for a tea to be called darjeeling it has to be say harvested or say cultivated uh, processed and packaged only in the place called darjeeling in india you cannot grow uh, or or tea and call it darjeeling if you are doing it anywhere apart from darjeeling so that's the kind of status darjeeling has it's called the gi status in fact darjeeling was one of the first product to get this gi status from india because obviously of its quality so yes the climatic conditions the weather the soil all these things also play a very important role the final taste profile of the teas moving further uh, now let's come to the main like the, the six different types of varieties which we considered so we'll just cover these varieties one by one talking about each varieties how they are different from each other so that we start with the first type of tea it's the white teas not very very popular but yes one of the most you can say one of the rarest teas uh produce we produce some white teas in darjeeling and china is one of the biggest producer of white teas now why these teas are called white the reason they are called white because uh they actually look white in appearance because for making white teas only the unopened buds the new buds Uh, are plucked i'll fact i'll try and show you uh, a picture let me see if i can share the picture with you so it's basically i'll show you a, a pluck diagram which will uh, make you understand better how these uh, white teas are made so let me just try and share my screen and show you the pluck diagram
So yes, so that's. So that's how actually usually a, a T bud would look like, and this is the new bud, which is used to produce the white teas. So new buds are basically the unopened buds, which has just come up, not even opened, and so most of the time they plug these leaves or these sorry these uh, unopened leaves to make the white teas. Or even there is an another variety called yellow teas. Also, they use unopened buds. So sometimes it could be just the bud, the unopened bud, the new leaf. Or sometime it could be just the youngest leaf, which has just opened. Now, why these teas are rare and also demand a high price? Because, like I said, they will be harvested only in a certain type of the year, which could be sometime only one time in a year in certain places. And also, uh, it's a tedious job because uh, the the people or these ladies who go into the gardens to pick up the leaves, they have to specially search only for the unopened or the new buds and pluck them, uh, which takes a lot of time and efforts also. So that is something which uh, happens in the the white teas. now again if you see white teas uh, undergo a, a very simple process so white teas are you also say that they are the least processed because they don't undergo any oxidation process as such and hence they also have a similar health benefits as probably uh, a, a green tea will have and since these new buds when they come they have a, a slight cover of white lining or a white kind of hairs on the sides hence When you plug these leaves and you make the teas, they also have a little white appearance, and we call them white teas. So the most natural types consist of only the buds and the very tender leaves, and also the healthiest because of is something called as antioxidants. Now antioxidants are nothing but the polyphenols which are naturally found in the teas, and these antioxidants are obviously known to uh, immune, say obviously build our immune system and also to fight certain diseases like cancer or even heart diseases. Uh, same way like the green tea does, and also for weight loss, they are very very important because they help to kill certain the fat cells, the fatty acids in our body, and then ultimately help in uh, in a weight loss thing. And such teas, I mean, the white teas can always be enjoyed uh, in the the afternoon or evening. The processing in white teas includes includes just sun drying, or sometimes they just slightly bake the leaves. Now, sun drying or baking is called also known as a withering process, which means to reduce the moisture content, and then. they slightly uh, bake bake the leaves now baking is actually done to kill the enzymes which are there in the teas which can later on oxidize and uh, convert into a black tea hence to deactivate these enzymes they do this slight baking process which is baking at a slight uh, higher temperature to dry out the leaves the moisture as well as to kill the enzymes present in the leaves and then they are straight away packaged and Like I said, again, most of these the teas that we deal in, whether it is a white tea, black tea, we only use whole leaf tea. So you can see the size of the leaves compared to the teas that we use at home. The second category is green tea, which I'm sure is very very popular nowadays in India. Especially a lot of people they like to bring green tea or switching to green teas because of the health reasons. Like sometimes doctors also recommend green teas because green teas are again full of antioxidants. polyphenols uh, which help in uh, say uh, reduction of weight also helps in lot of heart diseases which basically helps in uh, avoiding the blockages of our arteries which could be because of the bad cholesterol and yes it has got in fact green tea also got a lot of skin benefits a lot of people a lot of uh, females ladies they also apply green teas or green tea face packs because it, it is known to open the pore of our skin and allow the skin to breathe in a better way so green tea has got every very different benefits all together and the way green teas are made now the reason why they are called green teas because obviously the leaf looks green even after the manufacturing process so in green teas again what they do is they do the withering which is basically allowing the leaves to dry they just put them on a floor or on a trough and allow the natural sunlight to dry the leaves so probably for a couple of days the leaves will just dry in the sun to lose the initial moisture which is there because when the leaves are plucked from the tea gardens they are very crisp which means they have a lot of moisture and after drying there is another process called rolling which happens in most of the teas except for the white teas and the yellow teas in rolling if the teas are very i mean the leaves are very crisp i mean uh, they have a lot of moisture then they might break into very small particles which is actually not desirable hence they dry out the moisture before rolling so that the leaves do not break uh, that much during the rolling process so in green teas usually after the rolling they immediately steam the leaves in in Ch in japan uh, they use a steaming method whereas in china they do use the pan frying method 
Now again, the reason is the same like white teas I said uh, because they want to deactivate this, these enzymes which are present, like the polyphenols and the catechins, which might convert into flavanols and convert the tea into black teas naturally through oxidation process. And but since we are talking about green tea, obviously we need to preserve uh, or say avoid this uh, oxidation to happen. Hence, they allow the leaves uh, to steam it. So steaming obviously means they steam the leaves at a high temperature, which kills or deactivates these enzymes, but also at the same time preserves the natural green color of the leaves. And Japanese green tea, if you see, since they are boil after boiling or sorry after after steaming, they will have a much brighter color to them. Just like when you boil a carrot or a steam a carrot, the carrot will appear much more brighter in color. So they'll be much more brighter. For example, uh, if you see the cursor, this these are basically examples of the Chinese green tea. Though this one and this one, these these two are actually because they are much more brighter in color, much bright green color. And also Chinese green teas, uh, sorry Japanese green teas will have a little herbaceous notes to it, uh, like boiled vegetables, uh, herbaceous kind of notes because of the the steaming process. Whereas in China, the same green teas they produce by another method called as pan frying, where they have big pans in which they put the tea leaves after withering, and this they allow to dry roast basically. They don't use any thing to roast, but it's just a dry roasting process which happens these pans to uh, deactivate the enzymes and to also reduce the excess moisture. That is basically called pan roasting. But in pan roasting, the teas sometimes because since the temperature is high, they might turn slightly more darkish in color, like something like this. Which is basically the Chinese green tea, and they will also have a little toasty, smoky kind of notes uh, after the processing. So that's the two main. That these are the two main methods which are usually used to make uh, green teas: the Japanese method and the Chinese method. And again, green tea is something which you can enjoy in the afternoon or even mid mornings. So any time between 11 to 3 p.m. in the afternoon is a good time to have uh, green teas. The third category is blue teas. Now, blue teas, also known as oolong teas, not very popular in India, but yes, slowly the oolong tea culture is growing, and they are also known as semi-oxidized teas. So now, before we talk about the oolong teas, let's try and understand now what is oxidation. Since I've been talking from the beginning that tea undergo an oxidation process. Oxidation is nothing but after rolling. Like I said, the first step in tea production is obviously plucking, harvesting. The second stage is to wither the leaves to allow the leaves to automatically wither. Which is dry in the sun, and then there is rolling, which basically rolls the leaves. Uh, some certain tea companies will do hand rolling, or uh, some, but most of the time, this nowadays it is done by machines. They roll the tea leaves, and during rolling, some of the time, in fact, most of the time, the cell wall of the leaves break. I mean, the leaves break, and the these compounds or say these enzymes which are present, they are exposed to oxygen or, or exposed to air, and then they again allow the leaves to rest for some time when the cell walls of the leaves are broken or rolled. Because then the natural oxygen will have its effect, and the oxygen will start turning these enzymes into different compounds, like natural, which is a natural biological process, like compounds like flavonoids and flavonoids, which actually give the color and the flavors to the teas. That's why we say that the black teas are much more stronger in flavor and color when you brew them, because they have gone undergone the oxidation process. The more you oxidize, obviously, the more flavor and color and the strength, or say the thin content. the tea will have so that all depends on the oxidation and this is again a natural process but yes uh, you should not confuse this with fermentation because sometimes uh, you might also come across some people use this term fermented tea now fermented tea is a different style of tea which is like a yellow tea or a mature tea which undergo fermentation process and fermentation is actually not natural they it is happens under certain uh, conditions which are maintained and fermentation is usually basically fermenting the leaves with the help of the natural bacteria and the yeast Uh, the microorganisms which are there present in the atmosphere that is called fermentation which is a very uh, particular process only for certain types of teas which i'll uh, tell you later but yes uh, most oolong teas the black teas they all go under oxidation process which is basically exposing to air is the same process which happens when you cut an apple for example you cut an apple and you keep it in the open for far, some time you'll see that apple starts turning reddish in color so that is something which because what happens when the apple is cut these compounds which are say uh, the enzymes which are there in apple they are exposed to oxygen and they start turning into different other compounds giving it a brownish color same happens with teas also if you see now teas from green when you semi oxidize for example in oolong tea they don't uh, put them through the entire oxidation process but a very small uh, can say for a limited time oxidation happens which will be only for a few hours or say a couple of hours they allow the teas to oxidize and then you get a something like a bluish kind of appearance sometime or probably something like a mix of black and green color 
and that is also the reason why they call it blue teas because after the semi oxidation process sometimes these teas they look slightly bluish in color like for example this particular picture you can see and oolong is a word again given by chinese people because this was the first name given to these teas because oolong means black dragon because sometimes when you roll these leaves the way they roll it they it looks like a black dragon in appearance that's what the chinese people believe hence they call it oolong which means black dragon in chinese but again in oolong there are two main method and china and apart from china taiwan is the another country which also produces a lot of oolong tea so these two three countries are the can say are the countries which produce highest amount of oolong teas and oolong teas were actually discovered or you can say made because for the people who actually wanted health benefits of a green tea but also wanted on the uh, other side uh, a strong flavor and a powerful tea because sometimes if you see uh, some if you try to for example for somebody who's a black tea consumer wants to switch to green tea it's not easy because the green teas are not like i said very uh, strong in terms of flavor color but they are drunk mainly for the health benefits but if you also want a flavor and color in your teas or say a good character then you need to semi oxidize it which means obviously it will give you the flavor some color as well as the health benefits will also be retained from the green tea so it's like a good agreement between a green tea and a black tea you can say so that's what oolong is all about so in chinese method they do every little oxidation so about 12 to 15% which means the leaves are something like this more towards green tea side whereas in the formosa is actually the name of taiwan in olden days taiwan the country called taiwan knows to be formosa and formosa is uh it's a higher oxidation about 60 to 70% oxidation takes place for a higher duration they oxidize the leaves which means the leaves will turn almost black in color so the leaf the tea after oxidation will look almost like a black tea but then if you know it's a no long they can obviously differentiate but it has it looks something like a black tea which is more towards a black tea side uh, in terms of the color profile so that's that's about the oolong tea which is just remember that oolong tea is actually all about the oxidation but it's, it's a reduced or you can say it's a controlled oxidation process which happens in oolong coming to black tea which i said is the most popular form of tea drunk all over the world in fact in india this is the most popular varieties in black teas again you can have different grades so there this is the one that you picture that you see these are whole leaves you can see that there are long leaves dried leaves these are basically called whole leaf teas whereas the teas that we consume at home are also black teas just we call it uh, the danedar chai which is basically the city city like your local branch like uh, girnar or could be society or brookborn taj mahal all these lipton and all they are all basically city cities so city cities are made by a very different process altogether though they are also black teas they undergo the same oxidation process so the only difference is in black teas they allow the teas to form uh, sorry to oxidize completely 100% oxidation happens after the rolling process they allow the leaves to oxidize and this process could last from maybe 6 to 8 hours or even can go up to about 12 to 14 hours of oxidation process until the leaves are completely oxidized hence they will have the most flavor more colors the most powerful form of tea is basically the black teas and then again after uh, the oxidation process there is one more step of final drying before packaging it just to reduce whatever moisture is left and then they do the sieving process or sifting we call it sifting is basically grading the leaf because what happens like i said in the rolling sometimes the leaves break and when these leaves break you have to categorize them into different categories depending on the size of the leaves so the biggest leaf would be the orthodox or the whole leaf the second grade we call it broken which will be slightly smaller than the uh, the whole leaf and then there is something called as fannings which is even smaller than the broken fannings are usually used by a lot of companies in tea bags and then there is something called as the dust which is the smallest even smaller than the ctc that we use at home and ctc is actually uh, not a grade of the whole leaf but that's a different process altogether wherein it is called cutting tearing and curling so ctc this term used for cut tear and curl so all the the commercial teas like i said the grana societies and all this they undergo this process of so they have a machine the tree factory is called rotor vein which actually cuts the leaf first tears it and curls it and then how you get that small granule or the danedar chai that is called the ctc process but that is also actually a form of black tea so like i said the black teas could be both whole and broken and the best time to drink black teas since they have good amount of theine uh, and if you want to say have a strong cup of black tea in the morning will keep you fresh all day long for your activities so it's always preferred to have a cup of black teas somewhere in the morning between 7 am to 11 am and also a lot of like i said in the beginning a lot of people prefer to have black teas in the breakfast so that's the best time to drink your black teas
coming to the fifth category which is mature teas not again very popular not most of us might also not even know about mature teas they are also known as pueil teas now why pueil teas because the place where in china these were made is a small town called pueir from there this got its name now pueil pueil teas or the mature teas are something like your matured wines and whiskies like how you mature your whiskies in barrels or sometimes certain wines are also matured in wooden barrels or these casks for certain period to give them a little more flavor profile and to cut down say the bitterness and the harsh flavor profile same way in mature teas they mature it probably for few months or probably for few years uh to and this is these teas actually go through the fermentation process which i was talking about so in fact mature teas they will do both oxidation as fermentation and the leaves which they use are basically the bigger size leaves so they pluck it from the bottom of the plant or some in china they use those big trees to pluck these leaves because they will have a much bigger leaf size and these leaves are first again withered then rolled and after rolling they undergo a slight oxidation not complete oxidation but a very small amount of oxidation the leaves are oxidized slightly and then they are steamed so now when they are steamed obviously there is a lot of water or moisture and plus the leaves are warm when they are steamed they are hot and immediately along with the water and when the leaves are hot they immediately put them into certain containers or sometimes they also use these bamboo shoots uh, or uh, these containers made of bamboo wherein they stuff the leaves tightly in and then they close it and then they just keep it for maturation which means the tea automatically starts to ferment in those containers or on these molds we call it now why they ferment because due to the natural microorganisms like bacteria is present plus the tea was already warm so it had certain uh, temperature and it also had certain water so this humidity this water and the natural organisms they automatically ferment the leaves and then obviously they will develop a very different earthy profile taste profile which these teas will have and the best part of about the mature teas is they are again good for made for health reasons though in taste wise you might not find them very very good but then uh, especially for cancer patients and people suffering from hiv and all diseases these teas are very good immunity builders i mean they increase your life expectancy and also known to kill certain cancer causing cells in our body which the mature teas are very very popular for and mature teas are sometimes made in different shapes also now this is the picture that you see here is actually a loose leaf but then some mature teas after when you put it in the molds or these round bamboo baskets and you press them they compress them tightly and you remove them they come out in a round shape something like a cake shape so in china you'll see a lot of these teas being sold in those round shapes or cakes also called the pueil teas you can just break a side little put it in your water brew it and drink it so that's how also mature teas are made coming on to the last category which is yellow teas again very rare so like you must have seen in the beginning i have shown you the diagram the plug diagram again for yellow teas the same buds are plucked only the unopened buds uh, again very rare because yellow teas uh, like i said probably are grown or harvested only some only one time in a particular year and the name yellow actually comes from the yellow mountains in china from where these teas came from and also the appearance of the leaf because these teas also like mature teas and progress like fermentation process so after the plucking these buds they uh, dry them and then they slightly steam them to kill the enzymes and then after the steaming process they just allow the leaves to rest for some time before packaging which and this resting period is usually happens in a controlled humidity and temperature which means the leaves will undergo a slight fermentation and also loses their color so when they go a little amount of fermentation the color just turns from green to slightly yellowish in color so they look uh, yellow in color hence we call it yellow tea or yellow bud so we have got a tea in yellow tea and twg which is actually also blended with 24 karat gold hence we call it yellow teas and it's very very rare and very premium and very expensive teas also the yellow teas but yes people drink it like i said again for the health benefits because they are made from unopened buds hence have more antioxidants uh in them which are which are good for the health benefits so we have covered all the six types of teas coming uh, white teas black teas green teas blue teas uh and the yellow teas now coming on to a very different category which is like i said in the beginning is a herbal tea now herbal teas are also known as tisanes tisane is a french french term which means basically a medicinal in old and days used to make a medicinal drink made from barley water hence it is called tisanes and uh, so there are certain uh, plants or certain flowers certain fruits which you can dry them and you can just infuse them in hot water and drink it and then you can call it a tisan herbal teas sometimes could be a mixture of like for example a green tea with jasmine now in the market nowadays you get a lot of jasmine green tea so that can also be a herbal tea but then that will not fall into a tisan category because tisan has to be completely caffeine free or ethene free tea which means you cannot use the camellia sinensis leaf 
in that particular category. Like for example, one tea that we have, it's called the rooibos tea, or we also known as the red tea. Rooibos is a, is a bush which grows in South Africa, and it has these red color leaves which are plucked, dried, oxidized, and then packaged and drunk. Best part about rooibos is it's completely theme free, which means even childrens can have it because usually we don't allow the kids to drink tea because it has caffeine or theine in it. Or even the pregnant woman, it is not safe for them to drink because of the caffeine content. But then, this is something which is completely theme free. Similarly, we also have something called as chamomile tea. Now, chamomile tea is something which is basically the dried chamomile flowers, which are can be just put in hot water and drunk. So these are meant for people who don't like to actually drink tea because of the caffeine reason. Or sometimes people also look for decaffeinated tea. So it's better instead of searching for a decaffeinated tea, you can go for something like a rooibos or a or a chamomile tea. And there are many other. Uh, Uh, examples available in the market nowadays, like a lemongrass tea or a lemon balm tea. These are basically just the dried herbs or botanicals which are dried and infused in water and drunk. In fact, rooibos is something which can be made into a nice iced tea, also because it has a slight hint of sweetness and uh, every sweet caramel kind of notes to it. This particular tea has. So these teas are quite floral and aromatic and fruity, so you can always be used. And plus, they've also got a lot of health benefits. Like rooibos has a lot of vitamins, minerals, salts. which uh, is known to hydrate our body especially during exercise or during the summer season when we lose a lot of water these things can always keep you hydrated and these are some some ingredients that we uh, use in twg for blending so like i said all the natural extracts could be red berries blackberries a lot of citrus fruits are used like bergamot oranges we use for flavoring our earl grey tea earl grey is again a very popular tea style of teas people prefer to have in the morning which is basically a tea it could be a black tea or a green tea blended with some oils from orange called bergamot and then jasmine teas like i said are popular then we also have a tea which is called bend the roses where we also blend it with some rose petals and same way masala chai obviously you can see the some spices are here we also have masala chai in our portfolio called uh, compotu or the indus which is actually a masala chai version very very popular in india chocolate again nowadays we are using some chocolate also to blend our teas which is an interesting combination of we have a tea called chocolate al grey so like a citrus and chocolate notes usually go really well and mint teas like i said again very popular moroccan mint teas and all we have gold we use it to blend with uh, our yellow buds or the yellow teas and uh, dry fruits yes obviously you can also to obviously give more health benefits to these you can also blend teas with so there is lot to experiment nowadays with tea you can you can blend it with all the different natural ingredients uh to make different flavors profile because like i said our main motto is to match, match the taste profile of the consumer so we we, we make our teas on all the different uh, ingredients uh cotton tea bags is something which we use so so we have like i said we use only the whole leaf teas for our uh, tea so it's whether it is cotton tea bag or whether it is the loose tea we only use the orthodox form of leaves so cotton we prefer because obviously it allows the teas to breathe and it also gives the teas the space to expand when you brew it in hot water and this Obviously, is very very important for the teas to give release its flavors and characters in a proper way. Apart from cotton, the other alternate option that we have is silk, silk and tea bags also. So both cotton and silk being uh, basically kind of fabrics, they allow the teas to uh, brew well and release the aromas and the the characters, the flavors well. Compared to obviously the the tea bags, the filter papers, which is sometimes used, which probably might not give that much space to teas. So hence we always. prefer to have uh, a cotton or a silken tea bag for tea and then obviously we have a light nice range of teas as well so before we go on to the the food pairing part i think it's also important for us to uh, discuss a little bit about since we are talking about cotton tea bags and brewing let's also talk about how to brew a perfect cup of tea which is very very important especially so i'm not saying how to make a tea at home because the tea that we make at home is very different so that's basically a tea that we boil or we also known as cooked tea putting everything together in the pan and then allowing the bottle but then if you actually want to enjoy a whole leaf or a orthodox leaf tea then what should we do to to brew and so it's always good to have uh, a pot wherein you can brew your teas in, uh, and you can always the best thing is to first preheat this pot so just pour a little hot water and just swirl it or just rinse the pot that because the, the pot should be warm before you start brewing your tea and once you have throw in the water discard the water away the tea the, the pot is already warm from inside and then you can obviously put some tea leaves usually the ratio that we recommend is 2.5 grams in our tea bags also we use 2.5 grams to about 150 to 180 ml of water so if you have a small pot it will hold about 180 to 200 ml if you have a cup also it will hold about 150 ml of water so that's the ratio you can always use even if you do using loose tea you don't have a tea bag take a teaspoon and just fill it up to the brim like a heap teaspoon full 
and then you can put it in your 150 to 180 ml of hot water and make sure that for brewing teas your water is not boiled it should be slightly below the boiling point because most of the time what we what we do is we just boil our water but but boiling is done only when you're making uh, a, the cooked tea or a masala cha or something but usually for brewing teas make sure that the water should not be allowed to come to a boil so even if you're doing it in an electric kettle or something just switch off the kettle before the boil water actually reaches the boiling point which means the water temperature should be somewhere around 90 to 95 degrees celsius which is the ideal temperature to brew most of the teas whole leaf teas i'm saying and then it will give you a correct flavor because what happens when you boil the water to 100 degrees celsius the water itself gets killed because of water has its own flavors has some mineral contents plus when you put that hot piping hot water or say the boiled water immediately on the tea leaves especially the whole leaf teas which are more about flavors and cactus the hot water also kills the the flavor profiles of the cactus of certain leaves because it is very hot about boiling point so 100 degrees celsius is not advisable for for boiling but you can always uh, i'm not saying that you have to obviously use a thermometer or something every time to put it in your water and check the temperature but make sure that you just put it off the kettle or just put it off the flame before it reaches the boiling point even in sometimes in hotels we they use coffee machines and all to take water so those water what you can do is you can just take it in the kettle before you instead of directly pouring it on the leaves take it in the kettle just allow it to rest for few seconds and by the time you pour it on your leaves it will automatically will come down to about 90 to 95 degrees celsius so that's the best thing to do so that's the ideal temperature except for some white teas and yellow teas which are very delicate which where which actually demand for a little lesser temperature which should be around 80 to 85 degrees celsius but otherwise most black teas green teas can be brewed at somewhere around 90 to 95 degrees celsius and the ratio just remember a teaspoonful or if you are using a tea bag should be about 2.5 grams to about 150 to 80 ml of water to brew your teas and now again depending on if you want to have enjoy it by itself you can enjoy it or probably you can depending if the tea is too strong it's a black tea you can always add a little amount of milk and some sugar to it if you're drinking it for health reasons i would obviously say that i would drink uh, adding milk and sugar as much as possible the alternate options you can always use a little honey uh, in your in your teas but then again it depends sometimes the honey or the lemon a lot of people say that green tea should be drink with honey and lemon it is true you can drink it but then if you are a true tea connoisseur i mean somebody who likes to enjoy for example if you are drinking a darjeeling tea a nice cup of darjeeling tea then please avoid adding even honey and lime to it because it will again then change the, the flavor because then lime and honey has their own flavors uh, which will add to the teas so that best to have just by itself without adding anything so that's how you can always brew a perfect cup of tea coming to our, our our last topic which is about tea and food pairing now tea and food pairing is very important especially for all uh, professionals like us especially people working in the hotel industry because nowadays a lot of people when they order a cup of tea probably they might also order something to eat on the side so depending on the tea that you are say suggesting or for example you are suggesting a food and then the guest asks you to recommend a tea along with it so then again it's very important to understand what kind of teas can go along well so in tea and food pairing i usually this actually you can see this chart but then this chart is again just for reference i would say uh, because this is something which uh, we have made on our perception on the feedback from our customers from the guests because just like wine and food pairing tea and food pairing also has two different elements so one is we call contrast pairing which is basically opposite pairing and other is match pairing contrast pairing means pairing a tea which is obviously much more lighter and delicate with a food probably which have a little stronger flavors or characters i will give you an example for example uh, most of our uh, white teas we recommend that it goes really because white teas are very light the most the lightest kind of format is white teas but they go well sometimes with chocolates with basically with sweet preparations dessert preparations uh, cakes pastries they they go well with because though they are very sweet and the light teas are very delicate they still match very well with each other same way uh, there is something called as uh, match pairing match pairing is something like when you play, play pair a food which is has got a lot of uh, intensity to it could be because a lot of spices a lot of different ingredients added to it and the tea should also be of a equally good intensity for example say for example you are eating something which is like an indian preparation which has got a lot of different flavors to it a lot of different spices added to it very complex kind of food so then it's always the black tea which is recommended because black teas like i said are much more powerful in terms of flavor and character so black teas can easily pair along with foods which are equally powerful in flavors and characters because if you have a light tea for example if you have a green tea with a food which is very powerful in terms of flavors and spices that particular food can easily dominate the tea because if it is very light 
hence it's advisable to first look at what is the profile of the food and then recommend so this chart if you see says that i mean we feed talk about these chart that most of the mature teas the pure teas they go well with truffles with mushrooms the blue teas the oolong teas go really well with uh, white meats even the sea foods and can also be paired with eggs cheese and if you talk about the green teas green teas is something again which go well with sea foods can also be paired with salads black teas since they are very powerful should be recommended to be paired with red meats and games or food which is with strong flavors so that's how this this pairing is all about red teas which is basically the rooibos tea since I, i said it has got a very sweet notes to it so it can again be paired with uh, chocolates desserts fruits so this kind of pairing so it's all about our own personal perception so for this i recommend that try and taste as much as possible whenever you get an opportunity to try to try to also pair your teas along with some food and see what is going well for you so it could be anything like for example in india we prefer to have a masala chai with some uh, fried fritters or pakoras because the pakoras pair well with masala chai because masala chai has a lot of those spices in it has got some milk and sweetness to it which can obviously go well with the spicy pakora so that's again a very good example of a contrast pairing because pakoras are very oily and spicy and the tea is has got milk so this could be a very simple example of pairing so the same way the other teas also you can always pair them with different style of food but it's all about uh, understanding the flavor profile how to match it or how to contrast it with different flavors of the food all right so that's it from my end so whatever i think whatever information we had discovered i had uh, already discussed about this information this uh, this is just a picture i can i, I showed you uh, these ladies how they pick up these uh, leaves again this could be a very uh, tedious process sometimes especially in darjeeling when the the tea plantations are very on a on a hill slopes and assam obviously not that difficult because most of the plantation are in the valleys but yes certain places they grow these uh, the leaves trees are grown tea plants are grown on a or a certain level from somewhere between 2000 to 7000 feet also so it's it's not an easy job and they also play an important role in fact tea manufacturing because it's up to them the kind of leaves that they pluck because sometimes because the most they also actually require particular expertise so yes Tea plucking is also a very very important step. Okay, one thing which I forgot, we also have a, a video on tea manufacturing, so I'll just quickly play that video, and then we can start with our question and answer round, right? So let me just quickly play that video, and then we can go on to our questions. So this is a video on tea manufacturing process. Talks about different mainly. This is about the CTC teas, how CTC teas are made. But at the end, if you see, it also talks about the different styles of the teas, how they change their colors from the oxidation process. So let's let's see this video.
So I'm just pausing the video here just to tell you what exactly this this person is doing. This is basically done usually for blending the teas. So this is this is like a proper tea tasting cups and the pots you can see here. So what they do is they brew different styles of teas and then they these professional tea tasters they tease and sometimes they probably might taste hundred to one fifty different teas and they have a very trained palate again. Uh, most of these people who do the tasting, they're about 15, 20 years of experience of tasting these teas to decide the exact blend and also the teas which they would be exporting it or which they probably will be using for the commercial purpose, depending on the quality of the tea. So that is something that's process, the last process before they, they package or blend it is basically the tasting part. All right, so that was all about the production process. The last part was more interesting where it was showing how the teas after oxidation, they change color and see from green to slightly brownish and then coppery and then dark brown and then to black. So that's oxidation. The longer you do oxidate, the darker the color would be. All right, so that's that's all from my end. Uh, so all the points that we had uh, discussed earlier have been covered. So now I can keep this uh, session open for questions. I think Rahul, I will now hand it over to you. You can take it over. Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. Uh, in fact, uh, Divyanshu for providing us a valuable insight towards the tea production and, you know, the cultivation, manufacturing and even the tea tasting part of it. Now, uh, since also we are running short on the time, I would like to take up only two to three questions. Sure, sure. You can provide them with the email addresses. They can mail you the questions out over there for the further answers. For this. Done, done. I'll do that. I'll do that. So we have our first question out over here is that as a tea trainer, would you like to justify the high pricing of the tea in the five-star hotels? Because normally we go to see is, uh, you know, a masala chai also is like priced around 200, 300 rupees in a five-star hotel. So how correct, do you justify correct. the pricing? So see, for me, since I've also worked in the hotel industry uh, for a few years, but I also come from a hotel background. So when, you, when we talk about, say, pricing of the teas in hotels, sometimes we think why the masala chai is so expensive. Because five-star hotels is more about an experience. It's not only about drinking tea because... To a lot of people, it's the experience also matters a lot. For example, having a cup of tea at home and you have the same cup of tea at a, at a chai tapri or a cutting chai at the stall gives you a very different experience altogether. Or even when you're talking, chatting with your friends sitting at a chai tapri, you probably will not enjoy the same cup no matter how good you have made it at your home. And same way, it's, it's in the five-star hotel, it's all about the ambience, the kind of atmosphere that you are in. And obviously, that's the reason why obviously they, they charge you a little premium. And plus, there are obviously certain... Uh, certain taxes, the luxury tax and all those which are applicable, not only on tea, but I would say it could be on any any food product. So I feel that's that's the reason why 
so because the, the five stars they always provide you with with the kind of experience that you are looking for and sometimes probably you might also have some complimentary food or some complimentary preparations coming along with your tea which will also be form a part of your experience so overall it's all it's all about the experience i think yes okay thank you so much we have a second question which says that do we uh, i mean can we blend gold along with tea yes I mean, gold gold can be blend like i uh, in the presentation i said uh, we have uh, a yellow tea which is like, not all the teas i would say but yes certain yellow teas because these are the long buds the unopened leaf which can be actually blended with gold so we use some 24 karat gold which is which is blended with the uh, the tea so yes gold can be blended with certain but some very rare teas like the yellow teas okay yes. then uh, there is this question from one of the student who says that what is a pink tea what is pink a tea Pink, pink tea. tea. Yeah. Okay, pink tea is something which is very popular. I think in Kashmir they call it gulabi chai. Uh, also, I think the name is the noon chai, which they they make it. So pink tea is something which have this pinkish color to it. They they make it with milk and they also add a little salt to to that particular tea. So what happens? The salt or the sodium which is there in the tea, uh, in so which they add, it actually reacts with the color of the leaves or the color or the certain compounds in the leaves which are there. To give it that pinkish color, and that tea is a little salty and sweet in flavor. So that is called basically the pink tea, and uh, or also the gulabi chai and the noon chai. They call it in Kashmir. I think it is very popular. That's that's okay. that's the pink tea. Yes. Okay. So we have one more question. So as a hospitality graduate, I mean, I will be graduating, suppose in some time. So right. do we have an opportunity to get into the tea industry because this is something as a new career which you know the students right. can explore. i think that's a very good question so now if like i say like i said india obviously the, the tea industry in india is very big and it generates lot of employment so it's a good opportunity especially from people from hospitality industry if they want to make a career in this particular field in fact nowadays there are a lot of courses also available uh for example there is an institute called asian school of tea in based out of calcutta from where i did my course and there are a lot of online courses are also available so i would recommend that apart from doing your hotel management if you can take out some time during the course or maybe after the course try and do some kind of specialization in tea if you are looking at least i mean actually for a career in this industry and then there are a lot of opportunities if you see a lot of tea gardens tea estates they they need people who can take them it's like just like the wine tourism same like the tea tourism is also something which is growing in india a lot of tea gardens nowadays they also offer uh tourist tourist activities so you can always work with these tea estates as a hospitality manager or probably if you want to get into the technical part you can become a professional tea taster or probably also become a tea blender but obviously for that you also need to have a technical knowledge but yes there are there are a lot of opportunities with the tea industry also generates and i think this is very good for the students coming in from hospitality background to explore these opportunities okay uh, like uh, i mean just a question out of curiosity like we yes. have wine courses and we get, get a designation of wine sommelier so right, after right. doing this courses as you said like we have courses for that also so what is the designation do we get after doing this so uh, see uh, as of now there is obviously for tea also we there is a term called tea sommelier which but then that sommelier term actually has come from the wine industry only so uh, you like i said now that it depends on your profile you can if you want to there is no course as such which will uh give you a designation but yes on your certificate obviously it will certain okay, academies like i said the asian school of tea there is an academy in uh, sri lanka if i am not wrong china there is a uh, international tea academy they give you proper tea sommelier programs and they give you a certification that you are certified tea sommelier which obviously you can use uh, when you are working in the industry but again as a, in the tea company when you are working it depends on the company whether they want to call you a tea sommelier like for example i uh, have a position called head of trainings and tastings so but then my role is more like a tea sommelier wherein i educate people on tea i do a lot of tastings so again depend or for example if you go to uh, work with a tea estate you they might call you a professional tea uh, uh, tea taster could be a tea consultant or a tea specialist also so these are the, the designations which i have come across so it could depend on the company that you are working for but for a qualification purpose yes you can always go for a tea sommelier course okay so we take up this last question now so sure, it says sure. that uh, what is uh, the concept? sorry to intervene here yes, rahul sir uh, sorry um i think you can take a couple of questions more if the students are still there of course the rest they can write to mr gridhi but uh, you can sure, take a couple of questions sure, if everybody sure. So we have this question uh, from Mr. Ajay Kadam, being a faculty. Mm -hmm. He has said that uh, how do we go about doing the blending of tea at home, and what is the composition which we can use? 
see blending of tea at home uh, if you are blending two or three different types of teas it will depend upon your taste profile but what i have seen a lot of people doing at home is they usually blend teas with different spices could be from different dried fruits that is something you can always do at home sometimes i've seen a lot of people they make their own masala chais at home so that is something which is easy you can always blend your black tea or the usual tea that you use at home and use some spices like cardamom cinnamon <coughs> or cloves and all just probably roast them slightly uh, on in a pan and then you can blend it along with your black teas and just keep them in a airtight container you can always have it as a masala chai that is one kind of blending other is if you are blending trying to blend two different types of teas that is actually a little difficult job until unless you are yourself a professional taster because you might end up putting one tea more and the other tea less but yes it's through experience that obviously you can try some blending like i said the assam tea is a strong flavor nilgiri has got a very delicate flavor so if you have two different or three different styles of teas at home try to blend them uh, and then brew it and see how that blend is working out for you so it's more important to first understand the flavor profile once you okay after tasting obviously you'll realize that probably have put in assam tea a little more than you, next time you can reduce it so this exercise i think is something which you can always uh, learn through more experience and more tastings but yes blending okay. can be done at home thank, thank you so much thank you. there is uh, another question which says uh, what do you understand by this new term called matcha green tea because there are a lot of these right. you know, facts and everything available with that concept so correct is- correct so matcha i'll tell you uh, is actually a japanese tea lo- uh, style of tea so matcha is actually made it's it's a green tea ultimately but it's the only difference in matcha tea is it's in a powdered form so the japanese people they use a special type of tea called the gyokoro tea which is actually a green tea which is actually uh, dried in the shade so it's not actually dried in the sun but then they dried in the shade not very uh, say high amount of sunlight is uh, the tea is exposed to and then these leaves which are actually once they are dried and once they have been through the the steaming process which i had talked about the japanese tea they all steam their teas so steaming and after drying they have a last step is called the grinding step wherein they grind the leaves into fine powder and that tea is consumed along with the milk so most of the teas that we drink we first brew them and then we strain them off right and then we only drink the liquid the, the deco- decoction but in matcha the powder it's a very fine powder which uh, if you see the proper japanese tea ceremony there are a lot of videos on youtube can be seen just put they take a bamboo whisk and they take a small uh, ceramic pot they put some warm water in it and they put the powder and then it is whisked and it is whisked until that mixture becomes frothy once it is frothy it indicates that the entire tea powder has mixed with the water and then they drink it as it is so that's basically the matcha tea and again it is known for its health benefits is very has good amount of antioxidants since you are consuming the entire tea leaf in a powder form so it's it's very good for health and also for skin also it's very good sometimes certain uh, beauty salons they also apply the matcha skin powder as skin packs uh, or face packs on the skin also so yes so that's a type of uh, japanese green tea matcha we have one more question which says uh, are there any tea based liqueurs tea based liqueurs i haven't come across any i mean any commercial liqueurs but you can always make some nice tea based liqueurs at home because tea is something which is now also getting popular as a beverage in the bars what i have seen because we have been doing a lot of tea cocktails tea mocktails iced teas so yes tea liqueur is something which can always infuse so probably all your white spirits especially gin i have i've seen i have done i did an infusion some time back at home with tea i infused some gin with tea which which went really really well so you can always make some infusions at home as far as i know as of now in the market there is no such tea liqueur available at least in india i haven't seen it but yes uh, if you have some alcohol at home you have some nice teas at home you can always infuse and make a tea liqueur for your cocktails which is i think a very good uh, experiment to do Okay, there is one more question which says, uh, "What is a kava tea?" Kava tea again is actually a tea which is popular both in Kashmir as well as in South of India. So kava, they usually use uh, green teas, which is actually blended with the best thing is about saffron. They bring it; it has got a nice color to it when you brew it. A lot of Kashmiri people, you'll see, they serve this kava as a welcome drink in Kashmir. So it is basically a mix of dry fruits and a uh, little saffron. So in dry fruits, they use uh, almonds, cashew nuts. They they blend it with some uh, green tea. Green tea again, it depends. Some people I've seen they sometimes also use uh, black teas also. But yes, green teas is most more popular to make kavas because they are much more delicate. But it's basically a blend of dry fruits and uh, a little saffron with with the teas. And ideally, it is not supposed to be drunk with the milk, but uh, should be just drunk it by itself because it has got a nice. Uh, aroma to it because of all these different spices being added to it, and got a nice color because of the saffron. That's basically yes, a, a nice way of drinking. A herbal tea, you can call it. Okay. 
thank you divyanshu i'm sure like almost all of the questions have been answered in the chat box and in case if great, you still great. have any queries i'm sure you can write it to mr divyanshu he'll be most yes, happy yes i'm sharing i have just shared questions. my email id also uh, in the chat box so you can make a note of my email id in fact uh, i'm also sharing uh, our uh, website address because on the website also you can go and read a lot with a lot of information on the website so there is a content which i have created which is the faq question a lot of uh, uh, questions and answers are there on our website it's called the wellness store dot in which is basically an online platform to buy teas but you can also go and read a lot of information about teas on our website so i have shared that also and you can also follow us on our facebook and instagram page which is twgt india because we keep posting a lot of interesting stuff there also a lot of information lot especially we are doing now the summer cocktails and the summer drinks with teas which we have been posting on our insta and facebook page so i'm sharing that also that's twgt india okay uh before in fact ending this i would like to acknowledge the presence of our principal mrs sayukita murarji and uh, gracing this webinar i would also like to uh, acknowledge the presence of mr sid banerji who is the founder of a wine club He is basically one of the colleagues of Mr. Divyanshu who has joined in for the webinar. So thank you so much for all the participants for you know uh, patiently listening to the webinar. Uh, Ma'am, would you like to address you know to some to the audience? No, thank you very much, Mr. Divyanshu. This was a very informative. um a webinar we got a lot of knowledge and a simple thing like a cup of tea when we have every day we don't uh, have so much of a thought process behind uh, you know how it should be made or the different types of teas it was amazing a lot of content and a lot of information thank you very i'm sure the students have benefited from this and uh, it has been very very interesting Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. In fact, uh, thanks to Rahul also because he's the one who has been coordinating with me. The special thanks to you and as well as Rahul and to all the students, obviously, who were present for this session. I'm sure they must have taken something back, and this knowledge will help them somewhere in their future. So I wish all of you uh, all the best for your for your future and stay safe because we are in difficult times and drink a lot of tea obviously because you need to obviously keep yourself immune and like i said tea is something which can always help to build your immunity so stay safe stay home drink lots of tea all right so thank you thank you very much once again thanks to the entire team all the faculties thank you very much uh, sonjungita ma'am and thank you rahul thank you thank you devanshu thank you thank you i would like to thank the entire participants and the team of rph from my side with regards to you know for this webinar session Listen to me. Thank you so much. Hello. What happened, sir? Rahul, sir. Hello. Rahul, sir. You yes. students want to talk to you. You can yes. talk. Yes. 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 Sir, there is only one question I want to clear out. I just okay. put it on the chat box. Okay. Let me just go through it. so would you like to post the question i mean rather than me asking just i want to clear out with the so yeah that question yes yes so you can feel free to speak to sir he is there available prabhu can you just uh, repeat your question can you just uh, because uh, we are not able to i think uh, okay. send it in the chat can you just repeat your question what okay, do you like to ask yes so a person is addicted to a drug okay after having a drug after 6 to 8 hours they have a cup of tea mm-hmm. after having that they say i'm charged i'm charged again with the drug or do do the effect on drug or it's a refreshment of tea uh see as far as i know i don't think it's the tea effect on the drug but it says it's the refreshment of the tea like i said now all the teas they have some amount of tea which is a kind of caffeine stimulant which stimulates your body now again drug uh, it will depend what kind of drug the person had but yes tea has got its benefits for uh, hangout effects for after hangout it's a very good drink for example sometime if you have had a long uh, drinking session at night and the next morning you're having a bad hangout uh, uh, then probably you can always uh, have a good cup of black tea with a little lemon squeezed in it that can work as a hangout cure 
for certain drugs also i guess it may i'm i'm not very sure of the technical part but yes uh, like i said it's a stimulant so obviously it can obviously lessen the effect of certain drugs but for hangover hangover cure i'm sure tea is is, is a very good uh, remedy you can always have a nice cup of black tea with with this lemon squeezed in it and it's it's known to cure hangovers okay thank you sir thank you thank you prabhu thank you. so i would now request all the participants you can start leaving the meeting room i would request once again all the participants can start leaving the meeting room one by one <laughs> 